Dr. Mackay is a world-renowned expert on stem cells, uh, particularly using stem cells to understand brain uh, development and function. Um, he's done uh, a great deal of work trying to bring these uh, stem cells and realize the potential of bringing them into clinical practice. Just a little bit of background, Dr. Mackay received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh. He did postdoctoral training at uh, Oxford, where he developed some of the early tools that were used to study the human genome. He went from there to uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, which is a well-known uh, private research institute in New York. And there he studied DNA protein complexes and also was one of the uh, early people to begin the field of molecular neuroscience. Uh, he then uh, uh, lowered himself a little bit. He joined the Georgia Tech of the North, MIT, on the faculty in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, there he, he began, he shifted sort of his work a little bit, he began to work on neural stem cells, using them as a model system uh, to study brain development and function. In 1993, he joined the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the NIH, and he been there for quite some time running a stem cell biology uh, laboratory and molecular biology laboratory. Uh, most recently, he has uh, just left NIH, and he is now uh, going to be starting a very exciting new institute called the Lieber Institute uh, for Brain Development at Johns Hopkins. He'll be their director of basic science. And the goal there is, is really to take a very focused investment in bring stem cells into the practice and really make a, 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 an important impact. So it's really a great pleasure to have Ron here today. Uh, as, uh, as most of you probably realize, when you're in the middle of moving institutions, it's an extremely busy time. And so I appreciate you being here. And we look forward to hearing your, your talk on controlling stem cell function. Very much. Well, thanks for the invitation to come and, and speak to you. The, um, I realize when I walk around the campus here that I'm, I am a sort of techie at heart, no matter how uh, you know, unfortunate a psychological state that is, we probably all share it. So. One thing that's very interesting about the stem cell field, can you hear me? No. What happened there? Is, this, is it working? No. Yes. Yeah, very good. So one, one thing that's very interesting about the stem cell field is that it's moving fast. And so, as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing. But of course, it's not a good thing for people who want to control it. Right? But talking about the the Georgia Tech of the North. They're quite influential in this field, but I wouldn't let that worry you. They'll get left behind very fast as soon as you guys really get going. So let, let, me, let me start by, whoa. So let me start by talking a little bit about um, my origins in science. And what I wanted to do here, I realize some of these images might be a bit dull, but um, w w they don't really matter that much. What I wanted to do is I wanted to start by talking to you about when I was a graduate student, I was interested in nucleic acids. And DNA was the, the big deal of uh, biology at that time. And in, for me, the, the, the really big deal was the fact that in mammalian cells, there were 10 to the 9 base pairs. And so the question was, how were you going to study these base pairs? So at this time, there was no DNA sequencing, and there was no way of analyzing all of this information. Now, you, you know that that's not the case anymore. And so, so one of the people who was very influential in this process is the guy who's in the top picture here. His name is Ed Southern. And he, he was my graduate student advisor. And he, he invented this thing called the Southern Blot. And the Southern Blot is a remarkably simple tool. But, but, of course, those of you who know about tools, as you guys do, realize that a simple tool that works is exactly the kind of tool that you want. And the thing that was significant about the Southern Blot was it was the first time that you could, you could conceive, practically, of really mapping the human genome. 
And this paper here, where I'm an author, was the first time that anybody saw differences between di in the DNA of different humans. And here you can see, this is 1978 and this is 1983, you can see in five years this approach was used to map the, a disease, a, a, a mutation causing a human disease. The first time that a human disease had been mapped using modern DNA tools. So now, it's, it's 30 years later, and, and this process of mapping genetic differences between humans is, is a massive endeavor with vast amounts of money and energy and, and information that's been generated by this process. So there's, there's two points that I want to make with this initial uh, story. Uh, one is to get you to be imaginative. Stuff happens fast. Even when at the time that you're actually involved in, say, doing this experiment, you can't really imagine how in 20 years we're going to have the human genome. If you're optimistic and well-educated, you don't really need to know every detail to know that will happen. Right? And, and the second thing I want to do is I want to remind you quite specifically about the contemporary state of our knowledge about living things. We know a ton of stuff about genes and changes in genes, but we know very little about what happens when, when in cells that carry these differences. Right? That's this thing, uh, this subtitle here, from genotype to phenotype. So biological systems are not very complicated. They're composed of information and then the implementation of that information. So the, the genotype is the implementation, the information, and the phenotype is, is the implementation of the information. So to understand the, the, how, the, how the information is implemented, how do we do that? Well, we have to have tools. And what are the tools we're going to use? they have to be tools that actually implement the information. So what tools implement the information? Cells do, right? So we, so we need to build a technology which is, which is of equivalent rigor and precision where we understand the cell types and we understand the rules that control the way those cells implement the information in the genome. I think I'll stop now. Am I ahead of the game? Doesn't that sound very simple? Yeah, good. So how, how, did I, how did I get to this point? So again, you know, being, if you grow up in Scotland, there is nothing in Scotland, right? The next country over is Iceland. So, so there's a reason that the engineer in Star Trek is called Scotty, right? So the Scots have to invent stuff in order to live for the next decade or so. <laughs> so I, I grew up in this kind of environment thinking about information in, in DNA and when, when southern blots happened and I sort of started getting confident that we could develop all of that technology, I thought, well, why don't we figure out how the brain works? Seems simple enough. So, so the question that I asked really was, was, is the brain like a sort of classic Turing machine or is the brain a kind of solid state device with many, many different components, all of which have specialized functions? And you guys know that these are not mutually exclusive descriptions, right? And actually, interestingly enough, in neuroscience, th there's still a kind of misunderstanding, I think, of a lot of this. But the upshot of, of this was that, the, 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 that basically we showed that the brain is a hugely complicated solid state device with massive numbers of different components, all of which are specialized for different tasks. As uh, you said in the introduction, we invented molecular neuroscience. So now this is a huge endeavor, but again, we're faced with the same kind of problem that, that we discussed when, we, uh, when I was discussing the Human Genome Project, which is how are you going to understand how all these different molecules which make different neurons actually do it and it seems that the only real way to do this is to understand in some depth what the critical roles are of the of the, how is the system actually defining itself 
So again, it's the same kind of metaphor, really, as the invention of the stem cell, it's, uh, of the interest in stem cells itself. So here, we discover that the brain is, is a hugely complicated molecular machine. How are we going to understand that machine? Well, we have to understand how it builds itself. Now, actually, earlier on we were talking, and actually I used the example of Barbara McClintock. So, I don't know if, how many of you guys know her, but she was a very important geneticist. And the thing that was remarkable about Barbara was her powers of observation. So here, in a couple of weeks, you'll see at all the farm stands around town, you'll see these, these heads of corn with these patterns, these pigment patterns in them. Right? Everybody, everybody knows about this. It's one of the quaint things about America, that in the fall, you, you buy apple cider from places where they have these funny kinds of corn hanging from the ceiling. Right? But the next time you see those, those things, look at them and realize that Barbara figured out from, that, from those patterns that genes move. Now that's pretty cool. What's cool about it is this lady knew how to use her eyes. Right? When I talked to her, as I did when I was at Cold Spring Harbor, and I was banging on like I'm doing now, she would often take me by the hand. She'd say, Ron, come and look at this. Right? So the point I'm trying to make to you here is that you need to know, as Barbara would say, how the organism does it. Right? So the, the point I'm trying to make to you here is that the central point in the stem cell field is that stem cells make tissues. So when we, so when we made these observations that, that the brain was hugely complicated at the molecular level, the next question we had to ask is, what is the next step? And the next step was, let's find out how the brain does it. How does the brain do it? It does it with stem cells, and we already knew that. And, and the reason we knew it is because of the work of these two individuals. So one was working on, on the fruit fly Drosophila, Seymour Benzer, and one working on vertebrates. And they both showed that, that the nervous system comes from a set of cells that are not committed, but what developmental biologists call an equivalence group. And the point of that, of course, is if you want to just put it in, sort of in information terms, is that you now know when to look for the decision that generates all of these different neuron types. If you want to know how is it made, you have to know when are the important decisions made taking place. Right? And so the work of these two guys showed us that there's a specific time when these very simple cells make a decision to become complex. Before that, they're kind of plastic. They can make many cells, but at this point, they receive information which pushes them down a particular path. So that implicit in that is the idea of a stem cell. I mean, the idea of a stem cell is kind of implicit in the idea that we're all made of cells. But at this point, it, we know at what point we have to go and find the, the stem cell that actually makes the decisions that makes the brain. Yep. That's a sentence with like three phrases. They're all linked to each other. You're highly educated people. I'm sure you get the point. Right? So the, so the question is, so that stem cells exist, now we have to go and get them. So how do we get them? So we get them by just finding a reagent that specifically identifies them, and the first powerful, you know, genome-wide, to use modern parlance, tool was a tool called hybridoma technology. And this is an interesting technology also for, it, you can think about this at two different levels. So the first level is a simple one, right? Lymphocytes make immunoglobulins. A single lymphocyte makes a single Im immunoglobulin. If you can clone, if you can grow the lymphocyte that's making the immunoglobulin you're interested in, you have an endless supply of that protein. Yeah. So, so we find a lymphocyte that's making an antibody that recognizes these early cells in the brain. Now we have a tool which we can use indefinitely to generate this protein and study these cells. And then we take that protein and we do expression cloning and then we find the gene that codes for that protein. And then when we find the gene that codes for that protein, then we find the DNA sequence that regulates the expression of the gene in these cells we're interested in. Easy, relatively speaking, if you have graduate students who are smart. Right? So we did all that and, and now that, those regulatory sequences are used all over the world 
to control gene expression in neural stem cells. But there's another important way of thinking about this, which is we're using the biology here as a technology, right? Hybridoma technology is a biological technology. We're using the power of the immune system to do chemistry, right? And, and what I'm going to suggest to you is that we can use the power of neural development to understand the way the brain works, right? Now we have the stem cells in the brain, no problem. We can do all kinds of sophisticated things with them, some of which are indicated here. So this is, this is an example of how we map the DNA sequences that are controlling expression of this gene. So of course this is very interesting. There's huge contemporary interest in the regulation of gene expression at different developmental stages. Here what we're doing is we're doing real-time imaging of these stem cells as they differentiate. And so this is, this is using optical tools and, and as a consequence of this we can build real models of, of what people call the epigenetic landscape. So let's just, let's just slow down for a minute and ask ourselves what does this term epigenetic landscape mean? So it's a metaphor that was first invented in Edinburgh, I'm proud to say. And the metaphor is that development can be thought of as a, essentially a very simple uh, potential energy landscape. So you put a marble at the top of a, of a hill and the, and the marble just rolls down the valleys and it ends up in, at the sea. And, and that landscape represents the way cells behave when they develop. Right? Epigenetic landscape. Now, you know, when you actually explain what it means, no doubt those of you who are very sophisticated in mathematics and physics think, whoa, these biologists, they're primitive. What can I say? So, so what, what is not primitive is the, the tools that we have to build to actually understand in detail what these landscapes are really like. So we've started to do that, and these images down here are are real representations of cells as they, as they go through this. You can view this as a waterfall or, or, or a marble rolling down a hill. And these, these different levels represent different levels of cellular potential. And I think this is sort of really crying out, in a way, for a point of view which is not Newtonian, right? And is much more kind of systems theory type uh, thinking. Of course, the cells occupy discrete states so that you can describe it this way. But actually, underneath this, there are tens of thousands of elements operating. And that's, that's one of the more, more interesting features of contemporary biology. At any rate, the important thing here is this is accurate and reproducible, and um, these cells have very robust properties. So. So we find these stem cells in the brain then. So can we really get back to the issue of in depth of how they work? And one of the, one of the things that's very interesting is, is, is the first question that you would want to ask about them is when do they really make this decision precisely? Now, it's difficult here because there's so much light and there's so many of you guys up there in the... Do you get served drinks up there? Is it? Um, so I'll just make very general points, and then you can come and ask questions later if you want to, me to be more specific. But, but let me come back to this issue. So everybody talks about stem cells. It's now generally accepted that they exist. And I'm telling you that we go to a lot of trouble to find the stem cells in the brain, and that the point of interest here is because they make this decision about what cell type they're going to generate. So again, we're going to ask this question when, but we're going to ask it now in this system I show you we can watch the cells very precisely as they differentiate so that we can make a map of the events. But the map of the events doesn't actually tell you when the key event occurs because the map is just a history, right? It just says this is the road pattern, right? People no doubt drive down these roads, but you can't tell when they decide that they're going to drive down this road and end up at Georgia Tech. So the only way that you can do that is you have to be able to intervene, right? You have to create a crash on the highway, 
right? When, the, when you do that, what happens? Well, some people cannot change their path, right? Because there's simply physically no way of doing it. But for some people, they'll change their path. And then you'll know that actually they, haven't, they have a different strategy. They are making a decision, right? So a similar kind of approach works here. And so what we do now is we intervene with signals that are believed to control cell fate. And we ask now, using this precise lineage mapping, when does the event occur, right? And with some of these events, we can show that the, that the event occurs very early. And I think this is all, all going to be true quite generally in the stem cell field, that the, that the events that are controlling fate are happening very early. I say it tentatively because there's very few examples like this where people can say with authority when the event occurs. So here it looks as if the event occurs within 24 hours of putting the cells in the test. And normally when people measure events that are thought to be controlling the decision, they're measuring events that are like three or four days later. So that, in my view, those are events that are not to do with the decision itself. And actually, the decision, in general, is not understood in biology. Now again, guys, yeah, thanks for switching that off, actually. It makes life much easier if that's not reverberating everywhere. So, so let me just come back to this point. It seems to me another problem in the stem cell field is that, in general, when you listen to people talking, they give you answers the whole time. They know, they know what the answer is. There's really not much point in you being there. You're there to applaud at the end because they got the answer. Well, cool, that's nice. Right? This is particularly true of people in, in California, don't you think? <laughs> so, so I'm just going to come back to this point that I'm making now, and I'm just going to go say it slowly. The fact is, we don't know, in general, when cells make decisions about which fate they're going to adopt. That, that's kind of cool. I mean, isn't this an academic institution? Right? That's worth thinking about. Oh, really? Is he right about that? That can't be right. There's all these important people have worked on this. Have they wasted their time? Possibly. It's possible. <laughs> right? So that's a very interesting issue. So how does a cell do it, actually? That's very interesting, and if you approach it in the right way, some of the answers could be very simple. So this is set up in, in a way now to ask questions like that, and, and we might enjoy talking together about what kind of approaches would take you to the next step. As I say, to, to, at our, at, in our lab at the moment, we think some of the next uh, set of questions here could be quite simple, really. So another important thing about this approach to biology is that, you know, if you take a look at a sort of adult mammal, there's a lot of cells. And all of these cells come from a single cell. And I'm talking to you about this lineage idea, and I'm saying to you that fate choice is rapid, right? But you might now ask yourself, well, how many fate choices are there, right? How many of these events do you actually need to measure? Are there 10,000 events? That sounds like a lot. There's, I think there's a good reason for believing that there cannot be 10,000 events because, because there's actually, roughly speaking, 10,000 genes. And it, it, in, in almost any system where you have a complex system in action, if you go to the next level of order, you, you go down an order of magnitude in terms of the number of relative event, relevant events. Right? So let's say there's 10,000 genes there's roughly a hundred cell types. So there's roughly a hundred events of this type. Hmm? That's not a lot of events. There might be a lot of molecules, they might be doing a lot of things, but it's not a lot of events that we need to study. I think that's very encouraging. So of these cell types, are they all equivalent? If there's a hundred cell types in an adult organism, and they all come from a single egg, which is fused with a sperm, in the intervening set of events, right, in the intervening set of states, is there a commonality, right, between the brain and the liver and muscle? Now, of course there are differences, but, but are there shared properties? Answer, of course. So what are they? Right, so one of the shared properties looks like 
is that these, these transients, that, that, there's, that, that the pluripotent cell that gives rise to all the cells of the body, will come back to its properties in a minute. It's not the egg, by the way. It's slightly later. But that gives rise to somatic stem cells, and those stem cells divide. And, they, and then the whole sort of body plan is in place. And then those cells give rise to a set of cells which are termed in, imaginatively transit amplifying cells. And those cells actually build any given tissue. All of these data are relevant to this, but it, it's actually much easier, I think, if we just stay the, keep conceptual here for a minute. So, so one of the things that seems very likely to me is actually that this sort of commonality in cancer, for example, that if you, know, if you have colon cancer, or if you have breast cancer, or if you have liver cancer, there are differences in the, in the molecular pathways, but in general, it's the same set of genes. That's because this transition between a somatic stem cell and a trans amplifying cell, which I think is the really the risky place for cancer, is that transition is controlled in most tissues by very similar sets of mechanisms. So again, I'm trying to make the argument to you that these states that we're talking about really must be understood, and the control of these transitions is going to become a major focus of work. And for example, in our lab now, one of the things that we've set up is a model where we can use a genetic approach to transiently amplify the number of stem cells in, in, in any given adult tissue. And then there's sort of remarkable things that follow from that. And one, one of, I'm going to end up by suggesting to you that that might be one of the real ways that stem cell biology will stimulate regenerative medicine because actually, although we all look as if we're mature adults, actually it's very easy to make us behave like immature teenagers. Yeah, it is. Very easy. Much easier than you might have anticipated, even in, even in tissues like the brain. And so, 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 that, so that takes us then, if we just keep following this brain path for a minute, is we're still talking about stuff that's not really brain specific. So let's see if we can talk about things that are brain specific. Yeah, and I'll come back to this issue of cancer in a second. So this guy here was actually on the first slide I showed you. His name is Roger Sperry. He's, he's, a, in my view, he's one of my heroes, Roger Sperry. So Sperry, you know, everybody talks about, you know, right, left brain, you know, he's artistic, you know, she's mathematical. But almost everything that we think about about this asymmetry in the brain comes from Roger Sperry. And he also, like McClintock, was a great observer. And uh, when I was a student, he did an experiment that was very influential for me, which is which he took a goldfish and he crushed the optic nerve of a goldfish and then he watched to see when the animal first responded to light. And he showed, and he showed that when the animal first responded to light, it could make accurately visually guided behavior. Now I'm just going to go slowly here for a minute because when I, when I was teaching at MIT, I could always tell the difference between people who really should be doing math and people who should, should be doing neuroscience by, by telling them this story. Because, because there's two possible explanations for how, for how the brain works. One explanation is that you make a brain and then the animal sort of operates in its environment and it's kind of trained by that to, to function, right? It's kind of the neural network, it's the Turing machine kind of approach, right? Machine is completely general, right? If people like that, I say, you know, don't worry if you get a B in this class, right? But Sperry's answer tells you that the brain isn't designed like that. I mean, it's not that that plays no part in the brain, but it tells you that it's not designed like that. Because these fish made accurate behavior the minute they could see light. Right? So Sperry said, there has to be a chemistry, that's to say, not, not, not neural activity. There has to be a biochemistry that controls the wiring. And there is. But it's actually very poorly understood. 
And then what happens in the brain, something very interesting happens, which is at, at there's a particular point, for example, in, 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 in mammals, it's mostly after birth, interestingly, when, when neural activity starts to play a very important role in controlling the way the brain works. And, it, and people use this term, use it or lose it. And by, when people say that, it seems like any time you use it, there's kind of a, a reward. There's a kind of payback. If you don't use it properly, then you lose it. But actually, if you measure the sort of what I would consider the most definitive consequence of not using it, namely a neuron dies, that happens at a very precise point when the brain develops. It happens right at the beginning of synapse and circuit formation. Now, if you're sort of following the, art, the sort of way I'm thinking about this, you're, you're going to be here, you're, you'll be hearing a guy who's constantly looking to see that, that following Barber's advice. Ron, come over here and look at it. Don't pontificate about what you think is going on. So, but the point that you have to pay attention to is she knew what to look at. Right? And what I'm saying to you is that, that there's a, a very crucial point in brain development that we need to look at in detail, which is this, these first events where activity starts to regulate the way the circuit is formed. Right? That's cool. I think the term for that in computational science is algorithm. What algorithm is being used by the machine to set up the circuit? Now, I could be wrong about this. Right? That's not really what I'm asking you to pay attention to here. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. But this kind of an approach has to be used because you're not going to get the answer some other way. Right? You have to know how the machine itself works. That's kind of the point about the stem cell field. Right? And so what I'm doing now is I'm extending it to these early events in, in the way the function of the brain is set up. So. The, the argument here is that if we know this algorithm, then we'll be a long way down the road to understanding what happens when it's not set up correctly, when the algorithm isn't quite working properly. Now, if you come back to me and say, well, there's not going to be one al algorithm, I'm going to say to you, so how many are there? Right? If you say 10,000, I'm, I'm going to suggest that's not a useful kind of answer. There might indeed be. But my argument would be that probably right now there might be 10 or 20. And those, what they're going to be doing is they're going to be setting up the circuit. Right? And then the circuit is going to be doing a set of fairly standard computations. But this kind of an approach is the approach that we have to use. So, so that's, that's kind of the principle of this new institute we're setting up. And one of the things that we want to do here is we want to bring this kind of thinking into line with massive, the massive advances in human genetics that I was sort of alluding to earlier. So there really have been massive advances. And maybe I'll just talk about that for a minute. So, you know, when we started this sort of endeavor to map the human genome, by we I mean now human beings, we, ha we had no idea what we'd find, right? So, so it would have been, you could have entertained the idea that any given disease would have, would have mapped to a very specific, highly unusual subset of genes. And there are diseases like that. So, for example, thalassemia, that's mutations in globin, right? Terminally differentiated proteins, primarily expressed in erythrocytes, fair enough. But actually, for many diseases, schizophrenia and cancer, the same genes pop up. Ha! Well, that's confusing, Ron. Why don't we just stop now and get a coffee? I, I, don't, I don't really want to think about that. Right? So, but that's very interesting, right? So one, one explanation, for a long time, this explanation was strongly held, was these people don't have the right genes. Right? If you did this experiment better, you'd get the real genes that cause this disease. Oh, really? Well, what would they look like? Well, they would really cause the disease. But how would you know that? Hmm. So one, one issue here that I think is worth thinking about 
is that you don't know it. I think that's a fictitious argument. And the data now are getting strong enough so I think one can mathematically prove it's fictitious. So again, you know, it's important in, in presenting this to you that you're not trying to judge whether I'm right or wrong. If I'm wrong, come and tell me I'm wrong. But explain why I'm wrong. Because what I'm trying to do is, is, is to describe the categories, right? So if you come to me and say, you've, you've left out a category, that's, then I might feel a bit stupid, but I'd still benefit from you telling me that, I, that I've left out a category. So, so we've done all of this work. We've spent billions of dollars. It's hugely successful. So now we can take a disease like hypertension and we can take the human population and we can say that there are mutations in a hundred genes which, which contribute to hypertension risk. Right? And we can show mathematically that, those, that when we do that, we can explain it's usually of the order of 1% of the risk of hypertension. And when we do that across the genome and do it repeatedly, you can see that as you add up this 100, which contribute risk, you increase the explanatory power, but then you don't explain any more. Right? As you keep doing the experiment, that's kind of it. So there's two very important consequences from, from, of this study. One is that actually any given gene is not going to be the gene that causes hypertension. Right? It's going to be a mutation which influences the risk, but it's a real influence. It's not some metaphysical influence. It's going to give you real insight, but you need to know other things as well to understand why you get hypertension. So that's one thing. And the second thing that it tells you is that hypertension is a relatively simple disease. If you do the same experiment for schizophrenia, what happens is risk keeps going up and up and up and up and up slowly and slowly. It actually goes up above the 1% figure. And it, but you keep increasing the explanatory power by doing more experiments until you've incorporated 2,000 or more genes in your study. So that says schizophrenia is more complicated disease. Right? But, there's no, but there's, it seems to me there's no space left now for the idea that there's a magic gene. Now, this is kind of an important general point because, it, 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 for example, Georgia Tech, in a way, is lucky because you don't have a strong history of molecular biology. So I was trained in molecular biology. I'm allowed to be critical. So, but one of the powerful things that the, the molecular biologists did was they developed a very iconic kind of qualitative view of biology. And actually, for the time, that was correct. Because actually they didn't have the broad tools that, that were necessary. So they had to establish the concepts, right? And those concepts are extremely powerful, very important. But that phase of molecular biology, allow me to be very uh, aggressively simple about this, is over. Done, dead, finished. Right? The phase that we're in now is a phase where you need to understand the quantitative contribution of many elements. Right? That's one of the reasons why the stem cell field is going to play a more and more important role. Because these cells incorporate the action of all of the elements. Right? That's why we started looking at them in the first place. Right? They, they, they explain to you how the underlying biology is working. So if, we, if we're seriously thinking then of incorporating uh, this kind of work into our understanding of schizophrenia, not only do we need to understand the rules, the algorithms that establish the circuits, we need to understand the contributions of these different molecules to these different events. Now, I mean, that's complicated, but it's not ridiculously complicated, it seems to me. With the right group of intelligent colleagues, that could be implemented pretty fast. We can be doing that. So, so let me close by sort of focusing on this and really asking ourselves, what do we need to do that? So one of the things it seems to me we need is we need really powerful human stem cell tools. We need to be able to control their differentiation. And we don't, we don't need simply iconic examples of human stem cells. We actually need a set of tools that represent human diversity. Right? Because this thing about population genetics that I'm I'm, I'm stressing 
implicitly in a lot of the things I say to you is real, right? Contemporary genetics is mostly developmental genetics or kind of iconic genetics, which is important, but actually population genetics is very different. Let, let, me, let me see if I can give you an example of that so you, you really know what I mean. So, in this room here, we're all basically speaking humans, right? Might, we, some of you might argue that some of us don't quite qualify, but let's just agree for this. We're all humans. But actually, we look different, right? So understanding our differences, that's what the human genome has put us in a position where we, where, that, where we have to know where these differences come from. And it seems to us, in our initial looking at, at different human stem cells, that it's possible that there will re be really major surprises there. And I want to sort of close by, by, by talking about this with you, and, and then perhaps we can, I don't know how this works here, it's such a big space, but we can ask some questions, discuss things together, or we can just sort of mill around and talk to each other, and you can come and say, I thought that was rubbish. The worst lecture I ever heard. Then I'm going to say, why? What part of it do you think was so terrible? So one of the things that I think is really interesting, going to be very much a force that's driving this thing field forward, is what I want to close by discussing. So I've talked to you about stem cells, about where they come from, how many there are, what the kinds of tools that we need are going to be. And then I'm going to, say to suggest to you that actually in, in tissues, whether we talk about development or in adult tissues, Actually, it's possible that, that the system gets to the same end by, by several quite different strategies. And, and if that's true, we're going to have a whole lot of fun. Right? So, so let me give you a couple of examples of this. So in neuroscience, there's this phenomenon called long-term potentiation, which is a change in the strength of a synapse. And it's generally accepted that there's a particular class of glutamate receptor called the NMDA receptor, that plays an important part in controlling long-term potentiation. And long-term potentiation is thought to be the basis of memory. So anything that you remember of what, what's happening this morning will be as a consequence of these little changes in the strength of a synapse. And the NMDA receptor, we know, plays a very important part in long-term potentiation. And a huge amount of work done on this. But if you knock out the NMDA receptor, the cells still carry out long-term potentiation. Oh my God. How do they do that? Well, because they have another way of doing it, Charlie. Well, I'm just a professor, don't worry me with that. So, I think that may also be true in development. So yes, we have embryonic stem cells. If you look with the mouse, if you're using a single strain, when you differentiate the cells, indeed, they make other cell types, pancreatic islets, neurons, it's all very cool. But when you do it with human cells, you're doing it with a range of genomes. And now it's beginning to look as if maybe different cells really achieve these goals. When they get to the goal, it's really quite tight. It's not like they're radically different endpoints, but the path they take is different. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe that's how it works. Maybe what, that's what this whole population stuff is for. It contains all of these possibilities, right? And, it's, and it's, it has to be very finely tuned to end up with these networks that function well. And in the case of schizophrenia, about 1% of the time, it doesn't manage it. So, you, so the network's not assembled correctly, in fact. That's pretty common, right? That's not really an accident. That, that pop, those genes that are causing these effects, let's say, to use the term cause slightly loosely, have been around in the human genome for a long time. They must have other positive effects, right? It's that the system cannot quite get this right. What you're, we're looking at now is kind of what you might say the, the edge of the system, right? This is, this is, it's, I don't really want to use the term noise exactly, but we're, we're not just looking at a mistake, is what I'm trying to say. We're looking at the, at the, at the tolerance of the system, actually, is really maybe a, a better way of saying it. Now, guys, I'm in the happy position 
that this is the first time in a long time that I've given a research seminar that I really wanted to give. So I know that I've taught sort of rather conceptually to you, and I've sort of deviated from this because I felt that you really couldn't actually see it, right? But that's not such a bad thing. So uh, those are the sort of ideas we're trying to pursue. A, a lot of it can, is, is implemented in great detail, right? Databases on human genetics, magnetic encephalography machines which look at the hu human brain function in real time, labs that grow human stem cells, microscopes that look at the vascular system of the brain or, or show that the immune system is intimately involved in these decisions about circuit formation. So all of that's real and it's real technology and it's really important that it's done extremely well. But, but it's these, in this kind of context, it's these big ideas that seem to me to be attractive. I mean, if we can move down that path, then I, I think we won't have to worry too much about people saying in five years, what is the stem cell field doing for us? So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, and I'm happy to uh, interact further. How cancer stem cells form. Yeah, so, so, so the question is, so taking me back to this comment I made about somatic stem cells and transit amplifying cells, and then the question is, is this, is this the origin of, of cancer stem cells? So maybe you're lucky at Georgia Tech that you ha don't have a department of oncology. I mean, obviously there are advantages and disadvantages to these things, but, but the term cancer stem cell has become like a kind of you know, a kind of, uh, you get burned at the stake if you use the term cancer stem cell in the wrong setting, right? Those witches in Salem had nothing on cancer stem cells. I mean, I say this with some authority, right? So, and I think the reason that people get into these kinds of states of hysteria is when they don't know what they're talking about, right? And it's, and by that I mean, I, I think, I'm not trying to say that these people are stupid, actually they're not stupid. They know there's something important, they know a lot hangs on the outcome, and, uh, but, there, but there's not an acceptable set of terminology to sort of describe the events. So, so, you, so, let's, so let's talk about cancer stem cells for a minute. There's a guy called Henry Harris, who was a professor in Oxford, who, who wrote a really great review about cancer and what he basically said was that we will get a long way when we start considering cancer as a developmental problem. And maybe one thing that's worth commenting on is that for most of us, no matter whether we're 20 years old or 50 years old, our skin contains a lot of cells that carry mutations that, that could become oncogenic. So there's no doubt that mutation is, a, is an important part of cancer. But it's a, bit, it's a bit like this thing about the human genetic story I was telling you. But other things are going on as well, right? The mutation changes the probability, right? The probability of what? The probability that that mutation will, will be selected for, right? It's this genotype, phenotype thing. So where is the selection happening? So to know, to know the answer to that, you have to know something in detail. It's a bit like the story I told you about when is a stem cell making a decision? Right? So my response is, when does the cell become a cancer cell? It doesn't become a cancer cell when it acquires the mutation. Usually at that point, you know, the conversation ceases. I don't want to talk to him. 
So, so, so the cancer stem cell idea is an extremely interesting idea. But there isn't really a glib answer to it at the moment. But, but, if you, but a generic answer, right, is you, you won't understand cancer unless you understand the lineage. Right? So whether it's the stem cell or a trans-amplifying cell is really kind of secondary to understanding the lineage and knowing the growth control processes at these different stages. Very interesting. And again, there's room for simple ideas to lead to powerful outcomes here. In spite of all the song and dance, you can tell I'm kind of hyper-immune on the cancer stem cell. I might need a corticosteroid shot soon. Yeah. Um, so you talked a lot about the algorithm for stem cells turning into other cells. I was kind of curious, are the states in the system well-defined enough to where you something like, say, a flowchart even, to define how you go from stem cell to some terminal cell? Yes. The answer to your question is yes. The main limitation to this at the moment is human frailty. If, no, seriously. So we can go from ES cells to pancreatic islets in humans. We can put those cells into an animal model of diabetes. They work. We can go from, in humans, we can go from ES cells to hepatocytes. We put those cells into an animal model of liver disease, they work. Right? So what does that mean? It means that the intervening states can be defined. Precisely. The answer is yes. Do we know the answer? Do we know the intervening? Well, I mean, it depends at what level of resolution you want to know the answer. So, yes. I mean, the, well, I mean, so at the level of, say, the five major states, the answer is yes, absolutely. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's central to this. It's really a major change in the way we think. So, you know, prior to this, these kinds of discoveries, People thought that these events all mysteriously happened at some point in the body, which was kind of convenient because you can never really figure out what was going on. Right? But what I'm saying is not that. You put the cells in a dish, they do it. Right? How long does it take? It takes three weeks. Right? How many states could there possibly be? Well, let's say there's five. The first one is the pluripotent cell. The second one is a somatic stem cell. Let's say there's two different kinds of somatic stem cell, I mean, in terms of this, you know, these transitions. Then there's a transit amplifying cell, and then there's a terminally differentiated cell, five. Actually, I think it's pretty much that simple. There's a lot of commonality in different tissues. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't map simply onto gene expression, I might say, before you all rush off and do gene arrays. I mean, it maps, but it's not simple. Yeah. So what did I ask on that latter point you just brought up gene expression? You talked a lot about genes through the phenotype right. um, and population genetics. Well, population epigenetics. You're talking a bit, uh -huh. quite a bit about pathways ending up at the same state. You can use these markers to define the state, but in those transient periods of time where the most dynamic things are occurring, and then is this also, you know, you talk a lot about microbiology, that the tools developed to see those things, and yet at the moment of these epigenetics, we really don't have the tools yeah, well that's a very, very interesting question. So let's, answer, let's let, let at least discuss it at two levels. So let, let's a, a talk first of all at a very specific level, right? So there's a huge amount of interest now in, this, in epigenetics. And the term epigenetics is actually used in, diff, in two different ways, which I actually think are the same, but it's a bit like cancer stem cell. This, this, this can get to be quite intense pretty fast. So one way of using the term epigenetics is chromatin, right? What people mean when they, mean, when they say epigenetics is that you have to not only know roughly, but remember every single post-translational modification on every histone ever. Right. And if you don't know that, then actually you just sit up quietly and listen. Right? Now, so that field is very interesting. Huge amount of work, and those tools are being developed to, get, to give global, a global view. It's, it's very interesting. Things are moving. We're not really sure what's going on. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of techno babble there. 
I mean, it's super interesting. How it translates, really, to the level that we've been discussing here about the way cells behave, or the way the, the discussion we had in response to the last question, that's not known. And it's really not known. We don't know how cells do it. And uh, again, tremendously interesting area. And uh, just once again, guys, I'm not going to apologize for not knowing the answer to everything. So then, so then this, but the second thing I think that's worth saying, maybe we can close with this because it's a very nice general point. The second use of the term epigenetics, which is actually the way the term was used when it was first introduced by Waddington, who was the person who invented this term about epigenetic landscape, was basically around this idea, well, we know that there's a common genome, but then other events influence in a, in a stable, long-lasting way the way that information is used, right? I mean, this is the, this is the premise behind education, right? It's the, it's the premise behind, essentially, biology. It's, it's, the, it's the issue that we're trying to explore when we say that although we know a huge amount and we pre pretty much know all the genes that contribute to hypertension risk, they only explain 1% of the risk. That's not to say that the other 99% is all come mysterious stuff that cannot be pinned down. Right? It means that there's this other kind of information that we haven't yet measured. Right? And that this, this, the genetic stuff, is influencing the way the system behaves. That, both, both the chromatin use of the word epigenetics and this way of using the word epigenetics are very important. They're, they're not in conflict, actually. And... Um, it's very exciting. Right? It's really exciting. This, because that's, I mean, that's sort of the, what I'm, why I'm so excited about this new institute, right? So we take the, we take developmental neurobiology to a point where we can now actually really understand how sensory input, you know, how your way your mother treats you when you're three years old, actually matters. I'm sure she treated you very well.